these people are cheering on pro de Beauvoir later than some of the others, the brutality of the USSR. And like Rand would not have wanted yes. to be in the same room with these people. And mm-hmm. because of this, and I think that issue made me, you know, we, that they're on the opposite sides of this kind of great divide, I think really matters and really matters to how you judge them. Like, can you have been honestly a supporter of Stalin? Welcome, everyone, to our discussion of The Visionaries by Wolfram Eilenberger. Uh, I have before me today a panel of discussants who have lots of reasons to want to talk about this book. The book, I should read the subtitle of, Arendt, Beauvoir, Rand, They, and the Power of Philosophy in Dark Times. So one of the subjects of this book, these are four philosophers, uh, all of them women living in the middle of the 20th century. And one of them, Ayn Rand, is, is someone that all of us have a special interest in. Uh, and that's why I've assembled this group of, of people to discuss the book today. So uh, let me quickly introduce these people before we get into the thick of things. Uh, first, we have Greg Salmieri, who is a senior scholar of philosophy at the Salem Center at the University of Texas. He's also the editor of the Blackwell Companion to Ayn Rand. So there's uh, something that tells you about why he's interested in Rand. Uh, we have my colleague, Jason Rines, who's a fellow and instructor at the Ayn Rand Institute, formerly a philosophy professor, uh, an a expert in ancient philosophy. And we have Shoshana Milgram, who is a professor of English at Virginia Tech. She's written on subjects ranging from uh, Nabokov to Steinbeck. She's a specialist in Ayn Rand. She's currently working on Ayn Rand's biography. And I am Ben Baer. I'm also fellow and instructor at the Ayn Rand Institute with Jason, uh, also formerly a philosophy professor. And uh, I saw this book uh, advertised, uh, I think, a few months ago, and then I read a review of it in the New York Times, and I said, well, I'd better read this. And part of my interest, of course, a big part of my interest was that Rand is featured, and uh, I was interested to see that she was being put into a kind of virtual conversation with uh, these other contemporary thinkers of her day, um, who are uh, most of whom are taken quite seriously by uh, by thinkers today, by uh, philosophy departments today, Rand is not usually taken so seriously. So it was interesting to see an author uh, putting her into conversation, and wanted to see what the result was. So, what do we want to say about this? Um, well, I said I think we said we were going to go around and first ask everyone for their general take on the book. And then we'll, we'll dig into the reasons for those takes. And I'll, I'll share mine once I've heard the rest of you. Why don't we start with you, Greg? Um, I also was attracted to the book because uh, it had ran in it. It's one of a couple of books that came out, I guess, in the last year. This one came out in, in German before, but came out in English in the last year that um, treats Rand in parallel with other figures. So I was intrigued by that trend. There's um, Freedom's Furies by Sandifer, which talks about Rand along with Isabel Patterson and Rose Wilder Lane. And um, there's The Individualists by uh, Tomasi and Zwolinski that talks about various thinkers that it views as libertarian. And so I see it as a kind of part of a, a literature that's growing where Rand's put in conversation with people. I was interested to see that. I was pleased that the author seems to be taking her very seriously and taking all the figures seriously. I didn't feel like he was casting shade on them. He was uh, trying to be fair to their views, and I thought largely was fair to the content of their views where I knew it. Um, uh, It's easier for me to judge with Rand than with the other figures. I was a little... There were topics in Rand's thought that it seemed to me odd he didn't bring up, given the things he did in the other thinker's thought. And I have a feeling if I knew each of the other figures well, I would have the same impression. It felt a little bit random what he included and what he didn't, and the book felt a little disunified. But I... Uh, overall was happy to see it, and um, it was thought-provoking. Uh, Shoshana, how about you? Okay, well, I, I pre-ordered this book. I was very interested in seeing what he would do because all four of the figures are of some interest, even though I'm most interested in Ayn Rand. Hannah Arendt would be the second one that I'm interested in and in, in, in read. Uh, what I also noticed that appealed to me from the beginning was the... The title in German was 
different, and the Thailand German in some ways is better. You know, it's the it's the the fire of freedom, uh, the rescue of philosophy in uh, you know difficult times. And I thought, oh, philosophy needs needs to be rescued. So uh, that was interesting that he was going to be talking about philosophy and not just politics, even though the dark times led me to think that he would be talking about the time. I also was interested in the fact that it was limited by period, 1933 to 1943, which does take us up to Ayn Rand's uh, first best-selling novel and one that she was always proud to have written. When I read it, I did, I admit, I did look at the Ayn Rand parts first, then I didn't notice what I thought was, what some inaccuracies but I thought, well, I'm going to read the book from the beginning and see how, how it goes. Because I was not as expert, certainly not any kind of an expert on Simone de Beauvoir, when I started reading that, I thought, let me check some of what I see here. And I actually had trouble with some of the accuracy of what he said about de Beauvoir right from the start. And not even the sort of thing that's a matter of interpretation, but he has a note, and then I look up the note, and it does not say what he's just summarized it as being. Well, that was useful, because that led me to see what I was going to see in the book, which is a big view by someone who is enthusiastic and exciting, and maybe even in some ways would like to be a novelist himself and a philosopher. And so he allows his enthusiasm to make him rush by niggling details, which some niggling details are important. You know, you can call it nitpicking to criticize errors, but if you don't pick the nits, you're going to end up with a head full of lice. So I think it is important to try to get things right. And frankly, that's important to Hannah Arendt. She talks about the importance of truth and what totalitarianism does is that it erases the difference between truth and falsehood. So I have to say that I started reading it more as a novel and as an impression than as something that I could take as a source. Jason, how about you? Um, so the way he conceives of this project, it's interesting to play off what Shoshana just said, is he thinks of it as a kind of nonfiction novel where he's balancing sort of four characters. And that's how he thought of his previous book, um, The Time of the Magicians. Um, and he planned a third one in a sort of trilogy. We don't know which four figures it was, but he describes it as he knows how to sort of juggle four balls at once. And that's why he does these. But he doesn't think of it as a kind of group biography, like a biography of the Bloomsbury group, because these figures are not really directly in dialogue with one another. Briefly, de Beauvoir notes Vi and they talked once. Um, but uh, uh, And there's a sense in which he kind of creates a axis in which Vi and Rand are, are two polar ends, and that's sort of uh, obvious in a way. But um, uh, but he, he's he picks a certain period of time, which is not the most fruitful period of time to get the magna opera of these of these women thinkers. It's too early, and he knows he knows that. But he his interest, he said in interviews is the intersection of philosophy and biography and like how what role philosophy plays in a person's actual lived life. Um, he also thinks that current academic philosophy is both stylistically and intellectually moribund. I don't disagree. And he finds it interesting both that these four women want, um, all of them when he was in graduate school would not have been called philosophers. Now they would. Um, all of them wrote in forms different from the kind of arid academic philosophical article for professional philosophers and journals. All of, you know, they were interested in writing fiction and journalism and so on. And that's sort of what he does. But I think it's ill-conceived because the, you know, the, the, the subtitle, right, as Shoshana mentioned, right. Um, it's the, the, the salvation by of philosophy in, in dark times. Now it's, it, it's not so much the people who save philosophy, though I think he partly means that in the sense of they're keeping alive a kind of philosophy that he thinks is worthy of a name. But what he also means is that philosophy was keeping them alive under, in a period of incredible pressure. And the thing is, is that that kind of comes out, I mean, but part, all that comes out is these are three, uh, four incredibly intellectually precocious and intense 
thinkers whose lives are lives of ideas and writing. And sure, okay, um, including the dark times in their lives. Sure. Um, how it actually sort of saved them or how it actively changed their personal lives is unclear. And where he kind of weighs in on that, I think he tends to, with the exception of Simone Vi, he tends to see um, a mixture of authenticity and self-deception. Um, that, like it doesn't bear out in their lives the way that you would think. It doesn't bear out in de Beauvoir's life the way you would think. It doesn't bear out in, in Rand. I think he thinks Vi really does, but Vi didn't save her. It, her thought killed her. Um, and in a very literal sense. So, I, I, so I think if you wanted to create a dialogue between four women who three, all of them are, um, displaced with the events of World War II, um, they're all women, um, intellectuals, all born between 1905 and 1909, all writing in a non standard form, all, and all of them, de- uh, anti totalitarian in some sense, and, um, all of them, interested in the challenging dynamic between the self and the other. Um, you could do that and you could make a really interesting conversation, but he didn't do that. He just recycled some biographies of these people during a certain critical time period in the world and in their lives and makes hints, suggestions about how you can juxtapose them, but neither does the analytical work um, nor, uh, in philosophically for you, nor, um, does the kind of psychological work in a responsible and really thoughtful way about how this was actually, how these thoughts were actually changing their lives. Um, and, and not just a kind of papering over of the problems in their lives. You know, I agree. I agree with what you said. Yeah. Obviously not a work of scholarship. Because in a work of scholarship, you show where you've been and other people can follow you there. You document everything. What I think, and I I think I agree with you also that it is not a book that has a thesis and demonstrates it. It's possible that he thinks that that's what other philosophers do and he doesn't want to do that. Uh, And partly in some ways, one of the flaws turned into a virtue for me because I could see he was not being accurate. So I thought if I want to really know, I I have to check it out for myself. And he made the characters seem interesting. But I think you're right in that the whole doesn't add up and that the very the very thing you mentioned about the conversation is only hinted at in one there's one place where he has just set out Ayn Rand and her ideas. It's around page three oh six, something like that. And he says, What would the other three do? if they were going to discuss her ideas and I, and would they, and he didn't name them, but he yeah. said, would they think this, would they think that? And I thought, you know, that sounds like a really good book. Yeah. You know, that, that right. would, that would be the heart of an actual conversation, but it's almost as if he leaves that to the reader. Yeah. This would be okay as notes for a book you plan on writing maybe, but not yet the book or background. Um, And it, I, I should just mention, Shoshana, but, um, in terms of he wasn't trying to do a, defend a thesis, and that's maybe what he thinks other philosophers do. I, I think that's quite correct. He his dissertation was on Mikhail Bakhtin, and he says that one of the themes he's interested in pursuing in his work is the co- concept of of polyphony, of just different voices and putting them side by side. Um, and I think one part of that is just having these different thinkers say what they're saying at a certain period of time, or think what they're thinking. But I think it's also sort of leaving it to the reader to make any kind of judgments about why, how they would relate to one another. Um, but in a way, I mean, you did the work of picking your subjects and picking your time frame. That's most of the, that's most of the, the, of the step towards a kind of editorial or, or, or point of view already. So, so now say something about it. And I don't think he does. I will say, one thing I liked is that it does, he is, a, he was attracted to these women for, I think, all, even if misguided, sometimes good reasons in, in a sense, um, their intelligence, um, their, uh, intellectualness, their, their, uh, they're kind of willing to do, figure it out and write the way they want to write. Um, and their, their 
And I think he thinks also in a certain sense, their, their courage or maybe it's bravado sometimes that they all, they all think, you know, it's the world that's wrong. I'm right. Um, and I'm going to defend it. Before I, uh, what did you think, Dan? <laughs> Before I share my take, I think we should get clear on one important thing, which is pronunciation of the second Simone's last name, because I've heard each of you say it differently. And according to the audiobook version that I listened to and the Wikipedia pronunciation guy, it's Ve, Simone Ve. Oh, sorry. And, uh, but, you know, it, you, it's okay. to be understood that it would be pronounced differently because it's spelled W E I L. Um, sorry. Yeah, I, mean, I guess because it's a German name, we tend to pronounce it in yes. a German way. And, but it's, she was, she didn't, you know. I guess she didn't, friend, write in, she didn't write in German. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I thought this I, I was a very interesting it. book to read, especially because of the kind of novelistic quality of it, where you're not just reading about their ideas, but you're seeing uh, what's happening in their lives, especially against the backdrop of some pretty dramatic uh, geopolitical events of the period. I mean, this is this. People talk about how bad things are politically these days, and I was reminded uh, how much better things are. Uh, in comparison with mid 20th century Europe uh, by reading this book. But as to the treatment of the figures, so the one that I knew the most about was Rand. The one that I knew the least about was Simone Weil. And so I was interested to learn about all these figures uh, and but also to be able to make estimates about how accurate he must be in presentations of their views based on my knowledge of Ayn Rand and how well he's presenting her. And on the whole, I thought it was better than a lot of other treatments of Rand by non-fans, uh, but still there are definitely things to, uh, to critique, and we'll hopefully talk about some of those later. Uh, one thing I would say is that I, about that is that I, I read this book one and a half times, so I tried to finish reading it a second time that it would have, so that it would be better in my memory. And on the second pass through, although I didn't make it all the way, I, I, was I was definitely noticing, noticing uh, uh, more, problems more problems with the presentation of Rand than I did the first time, um, uh, mostly because I think there were double standards, double standards uh, uh, by which by she was being judged. judged. Uh, she, he, the author is holding her to standards that he doesn't hold others to, and I'll maybe mention some of those examples later. Um, but uh, it, it gave me the sense that he was trying to take her seriously in the eyes of the audience without necessarily really taking her as seriously as he could have. Um, but, but uh, like I said, we'll go into some details about that later. Uh, Jason, in your comments on the book. Hey, can I just, um, uh, all right, if we're going to go into it later, but, but let me just say, that I think, I don't think he's doing it as, as a double standard in the sense that like he isn't taking her seriously. I think he's very dependent on the secondary sources and what they do wrong, he kind of repeats. Well, and I, don't... I think he also has the sort of style where if he thinks he has something interesting to say, He'll say it, and he won't necessarily check his his work. Um, and and so, and yes, it is more forgiving of Ve as com compared to the other three. Um, but I don't think it's like, but, but at least from things I've seen, I think he thinks he's he's generally interested in what Rand is saying and what she's doing, um, and is impressed as with her as a person, even if he doesn't agree with the ideas, but. So yeah, it can come off like, well, that's more unfair to her than it is on this than he was with some other dimension of somebody else. But I don't, it, it's almost giving him too much credit to say that it's a double standard. I just think it's, he's just sloppy and kind of hit or miss. The treatment of, of Rand and Nietzsche, I thought was the weakest thing about his treatment of Rand. He reads her through Nietzsche um, and doesn't think enough about points where she's di where she's different, including in places where he sort of indicates them. Once or twice early on, he indicates things, but then that just goes by the wayside and Rand is a Nietzschean. And there's not thought about, well, how is how she's similar and different from Nietzsche uh, relevant here? And that's particularly important if you're thinking about Rand's thinking through the period of totalitarianism. What does she make of the Nazis? What does she make of the communists? What does she make of the right kind of social relationship? And again, it's not like you could read the book and not see that there's a difference, but it, it's so in the background. Um, and I think that's a, the, the worst problem in the treatment of her. And I think for the benefit of our audience, and we've, we've referenced Simone Weil a few times now, uh, she's one of these four uh, subjects of the book. 
we should we should say something about the ideas about her, what her ideas are. and maybe this is a way of easing into a uh, discussion of what the theme of the book is it yeah. came up already once in this conversation that there's a way in which the author well, rightly portrays Rand's ideas as antithetical to Vey's. They're kind of perfect antipodes in a way. And uh, so we know Ayn Rand is an advocate of individualism, of a kind of ethical egoism and laissez-faire capitalism. And Jason, how would you characterize Vey's very different ideas? Vey um, begins as a Marxist, then becomes a um, a non-Marxist socialist, um, kind of trade unionist, um, and then she becomes a Catholic Christian mystic. Um, the through line throughout her entire uh, intellectual life is an extremely intense form of, of altruism and a notion of um, one's both more obligations to others, um, though that somewhat shifts at the very end towards obligations to God. Um, she, st um, she is anti-totalitarian in the sense that she denounced both the Soviet Union and the Nazis, and like Rand was one of the early people who was pointing out that these are really the same. I mean, that's basically, they in a nutshell is, for most of her life, just intensely um, preoccupied with others and their suffering, and that there is just absolute moral obligation to do something about the suffering of others, that nobody really has a right to be happy or alive while others are dying and suffering. Um, that's the kind of essence of her for most of her life, and then it eventually becomes, um, I have this God is talking to me and Catholicism is the real thing. And it becomes even a kind of Platonism where real values are transcendent, not of this world. Um, the respective values of this world, including even the ego, is an illusion and a sacrilege. That's more or less Ve as I understand her. And what's, what's especially interesting about Ve is that she's so intense about at least trying to practice what she preaches, which gets to the the issue of how this book is part of what this book is about is uh, the use of philosophy in life, not just in an academic setting. Because so she early in her life when she's a Marxist, she goes to work uh, in the factories so that she can experience what it's like to be uh, a, a laborer and to deal with the alleged oppression of the capitalists in the system. And then she goes to fight in the Spanish Civil War in her uh, very amateur kind of way, but she's putting herself uh, in constant threat, uh, in constant mortal peril, and then uh, later moves to you know, f working for, if not fighting for, the free French in their uh, resistance against the, the Nazis. Now, she's a, she's a slight uh, and sickly uh, 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 young woman who's not able to handle most of the physically demanding uh, tasks that she puts herself up to, but she's, she doesn't seem to care about uh, her health or well-being. And uh, it's, it's always about finding the most suffering people and, and working to, fi to fight for it them. It's more than that. It's more people. than that. She wants to suffer and yeah. she wants it to be very public and seen. It's really martyrdom. And right? she's like, not, I want, yeah, she's, and, and it's, it's worse than just, she's not up to the task. It's, I'm, putting in danger other people's careers and lives so that I can be such a conspicuous martyr. I'm going to go and really understand the workers. Meanwhile, her very well-to-do parents can save her at any minute. He buys her BS. She's a tourist, right? Um, there's, a, there's a really nasty moment where de, de Beauvoir is talking to Vi the one time they had a conversation. And Vi simultaneously it acts like morally holier than thou art and makes a crack about de Beauvoir's appearance and says, it's clear that you've never gone hungry. Well, de, Simone Vi never had to go hungry. She just refused to eat um, <laughs> in a very conspicuous way and, and probably drove her parents who enable her to desperation, hoping that she wouldn't starve herself to death, which she eventually did. Um, and, and, and so, and even though she changes her ideas over time, the holier than thou attitude and the I have this I, 
it's the most important thing in the world is for everybody to see me martyring myself never goes away. And I, Eilenberger seems to confuse the recklessness of it with courage. And I don't think it's courageous. I think it's neurotic. But what, well, I think that what he, what he likes is that she's not a, a hypocrite. But what okay. He, what and she, you could say, look what she's not a hypocrite about, but at least, you know, she, she walks the walk and not, she doesn't just talk the talk. But she I, doesn't. I think, I, I think that what, well, what she actually does is she puts herself at risk um, she has that accident with the boiling oil and that's why she doesn't go off to serve. But not every single idea of hers is about throwing her life away. She had that idea about a squad of nurses who were trained to go into the dangerous about parts. other women's lives away. Yeah. No, no, she was going to do it herself. A and, and them. Yeah. Okay. But the, the, the idea, though, is that that's not for nothing. You know, well, going into a dangerous place as a trained nurse is not for nothing. What well, no. she wanted to get done in that case, as I remember from the text, Healing is that it wasn't Healing even that she thought the nurses would be able to accomplish anything. It was that it would be a dramatic Symbolic. demonstration of the difference in the worldviews between fascism and, and ultra altruism, where for that to really work, the nurses need to need to die. Or, uh, well, I think not... it's specially trained. So, you know, they throw away the training. But... Specially trained to die. I mean, like to, to do this triage in the middle of battlefields. But, but I think Ben's right. Like the whole idea is that this will become, they will be martyrs, right? And they will prove to the world as if the world didn't understand this. Nazis are bad. Um, uh, we're good. Only her notion of goodness is, is by say Rand's uh, understanding, the very thing that caused Nazism in the first place. Yeah, that for morality for her it amounts to being willing to suffer. You were mentioning the eating. Um, one of the incidents reported from a friend of hers who also was the one who's the biographical source is that she was at the table with her parents and the question came up of what would happen if a German landed here, would you turn him in? And so on. And father said, of course. And she said, okay, I'm not eating with you. You know, I will. I won't share a table with you when exactly this issue of not eating. Yeah, Greg, you and were trying to jump in. It, on it's a kind of power, I mean, assuming power by threatening them with her own suffering. There are two issues with with Vey. One is is what she's after a kind of self aggrandizement in people's eyes. Watch me suffer. Watch how much of a martyr I am, etc. Um, or is it the literal to be a martyr? It's not so much about people seeing her, but but she just wants to martyr herself. I don't know which it is. I don't think the, the second is any better than the first. If anything, I think it's worse. Um, but yeah. it's pretty clear there's not a kind of causal thinking about how best to alleviate the suffering of whoever it is. Not that I think that's what somebody should focus their lives around. But uh, I think one shouldn't. Uh, but the... Altruism in general is and becomes that it has to be a fetishizing of suffering, and I think that's what we really see in Vey's life. It's all about the suffering and being around the suffering and seeing if I could have some of the suffering of the sufferers. And there's very little actual, even attempt to better anyone's life, including her own. So it's really and, gross. So we've gotten some of Vey's views on the table. Uh, you can see then why. Uh, the author would characterize her as, an, as a kind of antipode to Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, the author of The Virtue of Selfishness, who was a critic of all forms of self-sacrifice, would have certainly uh, seen the views of Vey as uh, contemptible, did see th those views as contemptible. Um, I think that gives us a little bit to say more about the theme of the book, because what, does, what do these four figures have in common with each other? Why, why talk about them? Well, you see already they and Rand are antipodes on a certain question. They're antipodes on a, on a, a question about, uh, about morality, about ethics, about uh, life and society on the basis of that. They're struggling over what is the relationship between the self and society. Uh, and de Beauvoir and Arendt are also uh, also struggling with that same question and taking up different kinds of positions on the spectrum of the relationship between self and others. De Beauvoir is uh, described as being mostly politically uninterested in this book, but still 
struggling to understand otherness and its role in defining one's own meaning in life. And Arendt uh, is also, as a, uh, as a German Jew living in the 30s and 40s, thinking about what is the role of one's membership in a tribe and a nation uh, in making one a victim. Uh, how does one defend oneself in this kind of situation? Uh, and uh, and what, is it possible to define oneself or does history and position define you beyond yes. um, any, or is any attempt to kind of look beyond that essentially a kind of self-deception about the facts? And one of the things I found interesting about the, the, the four of them is that even though there are big, huge differences, say, between uh, Vey and Rand, especially, there, there's at least a, there's a way in which the author at least is suggesting, and there's a, there's a question, is this the right interpretation? But there's a way in which the author is suggesting that each of them has a sort of quasi-individualistic streak. So even Vey, uh, who's opposite of Rand, is described as being an individualist socialist. And the reason that she objects to capitalism is because she sees it as oppressing the individual by making him into, a, into the cog of a machine. And that's part of the reason that she goes into the factory to experience what that's like. Uh, and there are similar things to say about de, Bo de Beauvoir and Arendt. Each of them, in, their, in one way or another, puts some kind of emphasis on the importance of defining one's own existence, thinking for oneself. Uh, I suspect they mean very different things by those concepts than what Rand means by them, for instance. But I think this is the part of the thematic unity. And I, I wonder what the rest of you think about what the author is trying to say about this general idea, about the role of these figures in this idea. Uh, if there's an idea here at all, is this really a thematic unity or, or is it, is it uh, only superficial resemblances? Thoughts on this? I, I think they are all dealing with this question of self and other. I think with they, it's just the same old wine in actually the same old bottle. Um, it's just the ancient altruism kind of thing. I think de Beauvoir and Arendt is thinking about it in terms of how history and society may define us and how we may have to try to define ourselves in light of it, the, the parvenu and the pariah and, and what that, what, what it means to you when you're not part of any society as a refugee. That's part of her thought. Um, I think Beauvoir and Rand kind, kind of are more, more about on the same page at like a deep psychological level, how do you define yourself, your thought in regard to the other? Do you think for yourself, does the other affect you? Can they defect you all the way down? So I think in this formative years, Randon de Beauvoir really coming to groups with very similar questions along these lines. And unless we think that it's just how she's framing it in the fountainhead of sort of the first hand and second hand of the self or other. I mean, when she does sketches for a present presentation of her philosophical system after writing her magnum opus at, at the shrug, one of the things she first says is like basic kind of distinction, like self and other, um, as, as a kind of cognitive step of the, the child, just figuring out what they are. And uh, when she describes how the, be you know, the worst kind of intellectuals go wrong early on in their lives, it's in, in part psychologically in terms of their sort of terror and uh, obeisance to the minds of others and, and things like that. So it goes pretty deep, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that he does underline a particular question of, that all of them wrestled with the question of who am I and who am I in the world and who are these other people? Now, it's almost as if the philosophy is written in the first person, and even when it's not using the first person, I think that's one of the reasons when he's talking about Ayn Rand, he's leading up to Rourke and says Rourke is speaking for Ayn Rand, which, you know, that's, that's true. Uh, but I think that's the connection for him between the biography and the philosophy is that the others are also, and he mentions that a number of times, are speaking for themselves. And whether Hannah Arendt is writing about, um, a, she says that Rachel Barnhagen was, would have been her best friend, but she died 100 years ago. You know, it's, um, it's almost as if she also is, is writing in the first person when she's writing that, 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 that treatment of her, which um, you know, be, becomes the book. 
and de Beauvoir writes herself into her fiction. So, yes, it's a, it, it is an issue, the self and the other and the individual and the mob or the collective, but it comes up in both, well, actually, is the way, you know, Ayn Rand put it, you know, individual versus collective is not in politics, but in the soul. And I think you could say not only in politics, but in the soul. I think that is, that's a through line. That's something that they're all interested in and in, in a broad sense, you know, in a broad and deep sense, even yeah. if they don't mean the same things. Yeah, I genuinely thought, wow, a kind of deep comparison of de Beauvoir and Rand sort of thought about a number of issues, including um, what we now call gender, sexuality, but also just the self and the other, but actually be, could, could be potentially very enlightening. Um, and I mean, I found it interesting, assuming he's right about this, that one novel that de Beauvoir was doing was supposed to be, you know, self and other in kind of one's personal life. And then she wanted to go branch out and look at that same dynamic at the political social level. And that's what Rand sets out to do after finishing mm -hmm. The Fountainhead and turning to Atlas Shrugged. It, 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 you know, it grew but, beyond that. Sure, but you see, it's also personal. And the way he puts it, and I think this is a correct identification, is that all of them noticed that other people weren't like them. Yeah. And that, that, had compli that had implications because especially for some of them, they wanted to think of themselves as associated with other people or as immersed in other people or subsumed in other people. And Ayn Rand, of course, didn't think that. But, well, if I'm different from other people, then how can I understand them and live with them? I, I, the, the, he mentioned that, and he really had, it's around, it's around page 200 or so, I mean, I'm sure you remember, it. it's it's very striking because that's their fundamental question of how do they fit in the world. And he suggested that... And, and other people, and this is where he ought to be bringing in the beginning of the Fountainhead, where Howard Rourke is thinking, there's a difference between me and this Dean. And he, I don't understand it. What is it? And uh, and um, he suggested also, that is, um, Eilenberger suggested, not Rourke, that this question of I'm different from other people, how do I fit it, the, uh, how do I make sense of this, is not just a question that these four women struggled with, but it's somehow central to philosophizing or, or where philosophy begins. Uh, I think maybe that's too broad a claim, but it's a plausible claim and it's an interesting claim that at least a lot of people's intellectual journeys, a lot of the most interesting people's intellectual journeys include that as an element to it. And that's, you know, sort of, one of the things that's brought up, not too much explored, but maybe that's his style. He wants to drop ideas and get you thinking about them rather than, than work them out. And I thought that was an, an interesting thought. So there were a lot of thinkers in this period who were struggling with questions about the relationship between self and others, not just these four. And one wonders then why it was these four of all of them who were chosen and especially, why, why are all four of them women? Is there something important about that? Now, you can speculate about uh, what's faddish in academia being part of the reason why he, why he chose four women. Um, that by itself might not be a good reason to group them together. But is there anything interesting about the fact that all four of them are women? And anything that we can learn from this and about the fact that four women intellectuals in this period, female intellectuals in this period, are all thinking about the same kinds of questions or not? I mean, so this comes up and has come up like in interviews with him. And, and he seems to think like, yeah, no, it, there may well be some interesting things to draw out that all being women in this time period, et cetera, you therefore see. But he also could kind of thinks, I'm not going to make that call. I'm not, I'm not going to kind of make the claim that it's relevant in this way or that way. I think it is relevant in the just how smart they had to be to make a kind of impact as, as a woman in that time and really be noticed, even if posthumously. So that's part of it. I think part of it is just that they, all of them are likely to be very kind of determined to, to, to think what they're going to think and say what they're going to say and work it out and whether or not society thinks that's the business they should be in. And that's what draws him, I think, to all of them. Um, he admires that in all of them, um, and rightly so. Um, but he also says, you know, um, and I think this 
this explains something for me, which is that um, in this period, none of them are particularly interested in what it means for their life or thinking that they are women. Now, eventually, de Beauvoir would write the second sex, right? The most important work of feminism in the 20th century, right? So it's not that she didn't think about this stuff. Jason, I mean, there is a place in, in this book where it, again, you probably know more about de Beauvoir's original text than I do, but at least pages 88 to 89, uh, the author is saying that according to de Beauvoir, this passage that he quotes from her is a prime example of Beauvoir's lifelong conviction that the intellectual dispositions of men and women are generically different and uh, talks about the difference between plasticity versus rigidity. And it's, it's a passage about uh, men being more likely to get sucked into the lunacies known mm -hmm. as philosophical system, systems. Women are not by nature prone to obsessions of this type. So she does have the view that there's this differently female way of thinking. And I have more to say that, but let me hear what you have to say. Oh, well, if you look right there, it says that she recorded this in the late 1950s. Okay. Yeah. At a time when the second sex, 1949, um, you know, was already 10 years old. So I think it's fair to say that to read this back into the earlier time is maybe something like what we call retcon. Um, I see. So, Jason, yeah. you were making a point about the earlier de Beauvoir. No, I, I yeah. was going to say, I don't necessarily think he's reading this passage correctly. That is, I don't think that we should think that when de Beauvoir is saying this, she doesn't have in mind the fact that all of this is modulated by the roles that society puts women in. Mm. Um she's acutely aware of that right now yeah, she think thinks that true. ultimately there there is a biological slash historical explanation of how men came to dominate over women and and de beauvoir thinks that women are just more victim to the biological n needs of the species that they just have to suffer more for which probably is true um um and no it is true um but uh um but I don't think she thinks that there are, she doesn't believe in evolutionary psychological differences of men and women, how they think. That's not, I think this is just another example where he, he kind of crudely misreads mm -hmm. things. And again, I don't know this passage from her journals particularly well, but everything I know about de Beauvoir's later thought and the second sex makes me very suspicious of this reading. And I can point to lots of places where he badly misreads other philosophical texts that I know well. Um, well, that's even more interesting than uh, for me, because what thinking about this issue led me to was that I mean, if you so if you don't think that there are uh, genetic differences in the way that men and women think, uh, as as I I don't, uh, then there's still a question of well, then why are why does someone like the author fall for this uh, idea? And more broadly, why are men and women treated differently uh, when it comes to their role as thinkers such that a woman would have to work harder to be taken seriously? And I'm reminded of a point that I think some of us uh, must remember from an old lecture by uh, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, who's one of uh, Ayn Rand's students. Uh, talking about differences in male versus female psychoepistemologies, uh, where the difference isn't because of uh, genetic difference, but because of uh, socially, culturally uh, uh, entrenched habits that are, that, that, that are stereotypically associated with one gender or another. And that uh, I mean, he talks about how the men who are fans of Ayn Rand tend to be more rationalistic. That it, and, and to be inhabit realms of floating abstraction, whereas the women tend to be more focused on concrete experiences. And that made me think that the, I mean, that's not just something about objectivism, it's about intellectuals in, in, in I mean, many different yeah, fields. I think it's significant, let me, let me finish the point. too, though, about the, Leonard's lecture, that it wasn't a lecture on differences between men and women. It was a difference right. on, a, a lecture on two 
bad ways of thinking. And then he, he mentioned, you know, right. because of these various factors of how we're raised, one tends to have more men fall into it and one tends to have more women fall into it. Right. And so I had started this conversation with the question, is there anything interesting or significant about the fact that all four of these figures are women? And one of the things that we had said earlier was that they do all have uncharacteristic ways of doing philosophy. They're all very interested in the living of a philosophy and in the concrete experiences that inform a philosophy. And so some of them write fiction and some of them go and, and live out the life of that idea, as opposed to, in all cases, focusing on these you know, abstract treatises that you get published in journal articles. And so it does seem to me, you know, for whatever reason, because our cultures have decided that men are supposed to be analytical and women are supposed to be emotional and experience-based, that this, you would expect this kind of philosophy to come with, from women in this period, where uh, they're not beholden to the stereotype of what it means to be an intellectual because, because they're women. And, and in, in many ways, this is for the better, because it, it, it does bring philosophy down to earth in a way that in the, the world of male intellectualism, uh, it gets lost. I don't, I think there is actually something, Ben, to what, what you're saying about it. It, um, there being, um, certain pathologies of academic philosophy and it being connected in various ways to it being an old boys network and so forth. But in this book, we have two examples of men who forge this similar kind of literary, journalistic, philosophical career path. We have Sartre, of course, all the time with the Beauvoir, and you have Camus. And then, of course, you have Philippa Foote, um, Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, so women in the same period who are taking a more academic approach. So it, it's not, um, you know, one could be too, uh, one could make too much of that point. But I don't think it's entirely a coincidence that um, some of these more iconoclastic figures who are charting a different course are, are women when it's harder to do that in the um, in the academy. Yeah, and fair point and, about Scarcher, but and is a fair point to, nothingness. <laughs> oh, sorry, but the, the point about the and in the case of so there are also two recent books of the kind of of these of four um, women from, from Oxford: um, Philippa Foote, Elizabeth Anscombe, Mary Midgley, and um, Iris Murdoch. Um, Murdoch and Midgley had non-standard academic career kind of things as writers, but philosophers. Um, but even Foote and Anscombe sort of like acknowledge and Midgley acknowledges um, that had it not been for the total um, mobilization of men the war, from Oxford the during the war, they would not have come up the way that they did in the a academy. Um, so it, it may just be the circumstances of being able to get to the U.S. or being, you know, um, something like that really changes the trajectory. I think we should definitely come back to the question of the book's treatment of Rand, uh, since that is many of our entree into the book. And we've touched a little bit already on some of the, we've briefly touched on some of what we thought was uh, misrepresentative of her thought. Uh, we should dig a little deeper into that. May I and offer... A, a bridge from what we were just talking about to yeah, that. Sure. So there's one point at which Eilenberger takes a very um, kind of critical or suspicious read on Rand's more than one place, a relationship with her husband, Frank O'Connor. And in particular thinks that the kind of role she has in the relationship is inconsistent with her own characters and heroines sort of sense of, of sexual gender roles and the woman wanting to have this dominant man in their life and, and so on, where in fact he thinks she was, and he even sort of says she's the man in the family. And I think to bring this back to a question that one of you raised a, a few moments ago, one of the reasons that I think Eilenberger does this is he has certain gender assumptions himself about what performing maleness and female or masculinity and femininity would look like. And then is reading kind of ran in part through that interpretation as well. Yes, that is exactly the passage that uh, I had in mind when I was talking about uh, different standards for interpreting and judging these, these figures and uh, why I think 
Rand is uh, getting the short stick in, in this case. So this is, this is pages 126 to 127. She shares this, uh, this letter uh, with, uh, that Rand had written to her husband and uh, talks about how she misses him, but she doesn't really miss him and, uh, because she's gone off to, to work on her, uh, on her writing in a separate place. A Howard work, we can say with some certainty, would never have set such things down on paper, just as one does not need to have the eye of a trained couples therapist to detect considerable potential for tension in these lines. The role play is still intact while the roles themselves shifted long ago. And it's like, well, yes, one does need the eye of a trained couples therapist to infer about these kinds of things. And why is it that you are taking on that role, Mr. Eilenberger, uh, of, of psychologizing Rand in this case, when you're not doing that in the case of someone like Simone, Simone Weil's religious experience, which is described on page 168 to 169, uh, where she experienced herself in the form of Jesus Christ, entirely imbued with divine love, etc., asking no psychological questions about whether the fact that she's actually in the hospital for a neurological condition at the time might have had something to do with uh, her uh, misinterpretations. So that would be where you wouldn't actually need to be a trained therapist to ask the question, but it's not asked. And that strikes me as rather unfair. And also the kind of commentary on Rend and her husband's relationship when there's a kind of judgment there about a kind of faking involved, and there's so much less of that when he's talking about a de Beauvoir, in effect, acting as a procurer for, um, for Sartre. Um, I mean, if you're going to start reading, it's not like he doesn't show that there are some things a little dubious about their uh, little family, but the, <laughs> there's not the, the same degree. And the other thing with that letter... You about, should explain what you mean by the procurer there, by the way. He was scoping out young students and bringing them to, to sleep with Sartre and her. Um, but the pattern, the pattern is she took up relationships with her former students who were younger than her. And then often those then became the lovers, not only of her, but then of, of Sartre. And in one at least case, she's explicitly thinking, oh, this would be good for him. This will get him out of his funk. Now, the first place he brings this up, he describes it as clearly predatory, but then he drops that. And he cites a bit from her journal where she's wondering how much she's living up to these existentialist notions of being self-determined or, or how much is she just wants a husband and you know and that's and it's most interesting because it comes from her but there's a lot of uh of passing over some really and dark stuff in those in those passages he's 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 almost immediately dismissing the fact that she might be jealous and saying no because she's telling us she's not jealous she's telling us she's just trying to live by the strictures of existentialism and uh, there's at least a pretty good case for the fact that there was a degree of jealousy there, uh, which is just dismissed. What is that? And I, I should say, I don't think, I, I read him a little differently there. I think he, with de Beauvoir, he's pretty clear at various points that he thinks she's putting herself on. Um, my, my kind of, but I do see a difference between the treatment of de Beauvoir and Rand. He doesn't even consider the possibility that Rand feels about her husband the way she says she feels. Yeah, the, and it's just a role. The play. other thing is that letter that he quotes. Um, I don't think anybody just reading that letter would get what he says he gets out of that letter. I think the reason he puts that construal on that letter is because that's how Rand and Frank's relationship is portrayed in um, the various biographies of Frank, whether for mm, for yeah. for good or ill, whether it's an accurate portrayal or not. I don't think anybody just reading that letter would read any of the things about role reversal or whatever that he's reading into it. I think he has a narrative about her life that he's and about her relationship that he's picking up from these other biographies. Again, whether put aside whether it's a, accurate or not, and then he's just reading that letter in light of it in a way that I, if you just read it, it's, uh, it's a woman talking to her husband who's just left, and uh, you don't get any, I don't, there's not, I'm not objectively in there alone outside of that context, anything that would even lead you to suspect that. Um, and so then we could talk about what is the narrative on Rand's relationship that one gets in, in biographies, how accurate is it. But there's something odd that he's doing. He's not showing us why he's thinking the way he's thinking. Well, it's definitely I, I a good possibility. He doesn't possibility. even necessarily even cite where he's getting the information from. I mean, over on um, 180, he said that uh, Frank Valgmoder says, 
seemed not remotely inclined to provide spontaneous service to Rand's increasingly elaborate fantasies of seizing possession of the world, quote, like an animal, unquote. Okay. I don't even know what that sort of means, except that I did follow up the quotation, and it is from the journalist's description of Rourke as being like a healthy animal. And in the other time within the book, when he uses the quotation, he gets it correct. And so here he's, and it's not about seizing possession of the world. There isn't anything about elaborate fantasies. And so it looks as if he's got a source, but he hasn't even done it accurately. And it doesn't say what he says he's, it's supposed to be saying. So he's, he's made it up. Um, and of course, as you say, he's made it up because of some things that he's read, but he's not even saying, sometimes he says, my account of this comes from so-and-so, but he doesn't, he doesn't always do that. He just assumes that the reader will go along with him. The idea that he's getting this from these other biographies is definitely plausible. Uh, what occurred to me is that we're not, it's not, it's hard to prove that because psychologizing, by which I mean uh, it, trying to explain someone's behavior by unfounded psychological speculation, Psychologi psychologizing is just so dominant and widespread among intellectuals across the board, he wouldn't need to get it from the biographies. Then again, he doesn't do it to some of these other figures in the same way. And so that could either be just bias of his against against Rand, or, or it could be the biography. But it's not just that, no. it's that there's nothing in this passage that I think would lead anybody to think that. You have to have a, a take on, you know, Frank's this kind of nebbishy guy who just goes along with whatever his wife wants, and she's writing about these grand heroes, and he's not like that, and so forth. And all that he actually says is that he had a film career that didn't go very well, and then he, he went and did some other things, which isn't enough to get any kind of read on what kind of person he is. So where is he getting it from? And the, the place where you find it is that's how he's portrayed in all of these books and their assumptions as to what their sex life must be like, which there's no evidence for. A little bit of evidence there is pointing in the opposite direction, but it's not discussed. And, um, well, you know, so that's why I'm assuming he's getting from it. I think maybe he didn't read the introduction to the 1968 edition of The Fountainhead. I mean, and that's a real source. That's Ayn Rand's own words. And... That's also where she explains the difference between herself and Nietzsche. Just saying. I mean, I think that with another writer, he might have made reference to that sort of thing and given it some credence and said where he got it from. He mentions it's pertinent. Uh, he mentions that um, that Rand does occa uh, occasionally use the bon mot of 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 Frank in, in her novels. Yes, but it, he says um, her, her, add to her. T uh, regularly or typically hu um, humorless prose, and if you read the Fountainhead, like it's so, it's such a sarcastic, yeah. hilariously snarky book in various places. Whether you like the philosophy or not, it's, it's 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 not humorless by any means. Nor is we the living. Yeah. Yeah, they have a dark and that. sardonic yeah. humor in, in the kind of narrator and what the narrator says and doesn't say. It's it's he's just not a good reader. <laughs> Uh, not a careful. But again, there's this, Rand has this rep of being humorless, right? And you get it again in, yeah. in how she's portrayed culturally, and he just doesn't, where that comes from is a good question, and why do people see her this way? But I don't think like a lot of people independently see her this way. I think some book put it that way, and people don't bother to look past it. Well, I think that one of the problems that, you know, with this book is that he really is so vivid. And it's only when you come upon something that you know yourself right away that that doesn't correspond with the book or the writer or something, then you, you realize that you can't accept what he's saying 100% without looking into it. And that's, you know, it's, it can interfere with the reading because, you know, you, there are these question marks in the margin of, uh, I wonder what, I wonder what, what this, What's really true here? Yeah, he's he's uh, intellectually he's also I totally agree with that. Uh, intellectually, he's you know like some people don't want the peas and the mashed potatoes mixing together. He does not do any kind of way keeping this sort of out in in the in the thinker's idiolect. In other words, if you're trying to be careful. You wouldn't just put something away that your reader might understand, but a way that would also be recognizable and syntonic for the author. 
And there's so much that he will put, you know, he'll put Rand's view in a way she would never say for various reasons. So for example, you know, that she has the same contempt, like for capitalism as social. No, she would never talk like that. Like, yes, she thought people were second handed and, and had little lives and so on, but she would never treat them as morally equivalent. Or, um, he often will use in talking about Rand will use the platonic metaphor of leaving the cave. Now he makes an interesting observation, which is that there is a going underground and finding light bit in Anthem, but Rand in, does not use the, the, the kind of platonic cave allegory language for very good reason, because she doesn't think that, that the basic sense perception or the way that the common sense, people of the world is benighted and then you reach some higher vision. It's, I'm just more honest to the starting point where we all start and I don't mislead myself. So she has good reason to, to uh, observe that kind or to just have to not want the platonic language. But for him, it's just like, oh yeah, this is language of like going from being unphilosophical to philosophical. So let me throw it in. But he doesn't know how the flavor, pal the flavor textures are changing when you mix the peas and the mashed potatoes. and it, Yeah, well, I think that he's trying to make connections. And there's a section when he's talking about Ayn Rand where he explains about uh, human relationships having to do with treating each other as equals and cons uh, consent, trade, making a deal, and, you know, in which as opposed to force. And you know, he's talking about human relations. And then he says, but the most flex socially flexible way of achieving goals of exchange is clearly economic through monetary transactions. And that's not what she would say. I mean, of course, monetary transactions are a form of trade, but it's not as if that's the, I, the best example of trade. And then from there he gets to, and of course that means let's say for capitalism, as if the way she gets to let's say for capitalism is because she thinks that all human relationships have to be based on monetary transactions that are fair. She doesn't think and that's that. An example. And she doesn't say that. And while we're at it, by the way, I didn't see, I didn't see the capitalism book in his references. Now I understand that she wrote that later, but that doesn't seem to stop him in other cases. And you would think that that would be, if he's going to talk about, if he's going to mention capitalism, he might, Mention capitalism, the book. That capitalism thing but, is the same sort of foreshortening as in the copyright thing. Like, here's a point yes. she makes. Here's a place we know she gets to. Uh, here's a thread that would connect them. And it's not got nothing to do with how she connects them. But it's not. The center of gravity is all off. It's not how she would connect them. And it's a sort of rushing to an end he wants to connect it to without doing the work. And without indicating that this is, you know, one way you might draw them, Rand does it differently when she actually sorts it out or something like that. So I've got one that was a pet peeve for me, which I want to ask Shoshana about because I know she knows something about it. Page 177. Down to the last detail, Rand's sketch for Anthem is based on the science fiction novel We oh. secretly huh. passed around during her Leningrad student days written by her compatriot Yevgeny Zamyatin in 1920-21. I read Zamyatin back in college, and the things that I know are similar are the, the Russian's author, the, the author is Russian, the characters don't have names, they have numbers, and it's a dystopian novel, but that's about it, and we... And Shoshana, can you tell us more about whether there's sure. any evidence okay. that she even read and it? The other, the other uh, point that people mention is that it is called We. And the Anthem is based on the disappearance of the singular personal pronouns. I, I think that... And they still use uh, them in the book, right? What? The yeah, characters they still, still right, use right. They, they still use I in the book. Uh, I think that what's true is that he, he says down to the last detail, and he says secretly passed around, and... You know, it, uh, the basic impression is that, of course, she copied it. Well, in fact, I, I think a fair reading would see not only that the point is very different, because um, we is anti-Russian, but it's not anti-collectivism in the way that Anthem is. It doesn't have the linguistic um, originality. It doesn't have the same theme. And the device of a character talking in the first person, that's a detail. Well, duh, you, you know, that, that's, 
that's not unique to dystopian fiction. It's not unique to fiction. And it certainly doesn't show that there's a direct connection. Now, I have to admit, I did write about this. I mean, I wrote about Anthem and other books that you could put in the same category. And this is one in which I think that the parallels almost highlight for you the contrasts, that they're quite different, uh, even, even including the device of going outside the city. I mean, that also is fairly common if there's if there's a dangerous place, people might leave it as part of their rebellion. So I don't, I, I've kind of looked into this because it'd be interesting if she'd written, she does mention some, in, her, in her interviews, some books that she, some writers she knew or whose work she knew in Russia, she doesn't mention him. And I don't think that she would have said, oh, I can't talk about that because I copied him. Yeah. So it's a claim that's frequently made. I don't think it would be made if um, people read a bunch of dystopian novels and these were two of them. You wouldn't pick these two out as saying they're like each other. I, I, and, I, yeah. I think that's a great point. Um, and uh, that like, if you just take the scope and the genre, like, yeah, this is not, this would not surprise you. It doesn't. Um, it's only when you have just a, just, you know, something about this one particular and this other particular, you're inclined to make some kind of causal connection that you wouldn't if you knew the genre more broadly. Um, right. Especially bigger. since Samyatin's book is not about technology having gone backwards. It's about space travel. You know, it's a uh, technology going forward. And so that's very different. Now, I know it's, it's a detail, but there, there was a story she read in the Saturday Evening Post in 1937, and it was called Place of the Gods. Stephen Vincent Benet, and it's in the first person, and it's someone writing from a future that's decayed, and he needs to discover. So that element of it is indeed similar to what we have in Anthem. But, but it, I mean, it, the, it's sorry. We've, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say she had the idea of Anthem from her childhood, her teenage years in Russia, and the reason that there's a there is a generic connection here in the first person narrative, but she was hoping to get hers published. In the same in Saturday Evening Post, they and paid well, and it was a good venue. And she for describes her. the post piece as having been an inspiration to her yes. in the place where she yeah. talks yeah. about this in, in the biographical interviews. The same place where, unconnected yes. to Anthem, she mentions uh, that there were some interesting individualist authors being kind of circulated around right. Russia. Um, there was no reason why she wouldn't have said it if it had been an influence. And I mean, right. maybe it was, but it's, it doesn't yeah. stand out as a kind of certainly not copy. But well, one of the tropes that you often see in critical literature on Ayn Rand, along with the kind of psychologizing about her motives and the origin of her philosophy, is the idea that she just copied it from uh, some other uh, some other philosophers. There, this is often an implication with her relationship to Nietzsche, uh, and here we see another example of it. And I, I mention that because um, it's it's. Part of the reason I think that it's a trope is because the critics have the idea that, well, here's an individualist who claims that she is a self-created woman who's brought herself up by her bootstraps, and yet she's robbing and stealing all of these ideas from other figures. So it's an attempt, uh, not just at a general uh, diminishment, but a kind of allegation of hypocrisy. But then you really better have your, uh, your you better have the evidence for it if yes. you're going to make that claim as part yes, of a that's, series. Yes, that's the, the Ayn Rand ungrateful, Ayn Rand hypocritical, and so on. I have an example. I don't know if it's too detailed, but it really, to me, was interesting. And because it also ties in with what I was saying, what we've been saying at the beginning about the facts. When, uh, when he's talking about the acquisition of the contract for the Fountainhead, he writes, apparently out of the blue page 296, but in fact engineered by Isabel Patterson, the Indianapolis-based publishing house Bob Merrill showed definite interest, particularly from a newly appointed editor by the name of Archie Ogden. That's a quotation. Okay, now he doesn't give source for that, but I think his source is has to be Ann Heller. So I looked to see what Ann Heller said. And Ann Heller said that there were two stories of how she got the contract. And one of them is that she knew Richard Meeland, who was her boss at Paramount Pictures. Yes, she was writing the synopses for, and that he made the contact with Archibald Ogden, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's this other story. And the other story is that Isabel Patterson bludgeoned Archie Ogden into taking it. 
And the source for this other story, according to Ann Heller, is that Isabel Patterson told it to Mildred Hall, and then Mildred Hall told that to Ann Heller. It would have happened in 1941, and Isabel Patterson would have had to tell it to Mildred Hall by 1961, because she was dead after that. And then in, 2000, in 2004, Mildred Hall is talking to Ann Heller. That doesn't, that's not, and it's not documented. And the other story, the competing story is documented in public materials. You don't even have to go to the Bob's Merrill papers, which I did, where you, you get more information, but you don't have to go there. You, you, you can look at public documents and this other story, there's no documentation, but Mildred Hall said Isabel Patterson would not have made it up. So well, Patterson talks to Mildred Hall, talks to Ann Heller, and this, and Ann Heller says maybe they're both true. And, but what he does, now this isn't even scholarship, this is a game of telephone, right? You know, all these people talking to each other. What he does is he takes this story, which even Ann Heller doesn't see as definitive, and he writes, but in fact. How did it get upgraded to a fact? And this it's is a fact. A, a fact. I'm very you know, grateful so, you pointed that out. That's that's a really um, that's that's really interesting. And yeah, um, and and the things I I read that and I thought, okay, okay, what else is he doing in his other sources, where things have been upgraded to facts when it's a game of telephone, and he's gotten it from a source that didn't even say what he's saying. So, anyway, maybe. Isabel Patterson did say it to Mildred Hall, but it wasn't true. Uh, I think we should start to wrap up, and I'm uh, I'm interested just to hear if uh, any of you have any kind of closing thoughts or or comments you want to make on any of the issues we've talked about before we wrap up. I okay. There's I one topic we didn't touch on that I'd like to, at least briefly. Um, We've been talking for the most part about this book, but only a little bit about the the other women mentioned in it. Um, but I'd like to just think, what do we think of these women in particular? What do we think of all of their um, attraction to, flirtation with, devotion to, in some cases, socialism, and particularly communism, Stalinism? I mean, the Beauvoir was for a period of basically an apologist for Stalin. Um, so what do we, what do we make of this? How do we think about this? Or certainly for Lenin, um, what do we, you know, what do we make of this? It's, it, it's, it's not unique to them. This was a, a widespread intellectual trend in the middle of the 20th century, but I don't think you can, if we're talking about Rand and these three other women, they're on opposite sides of a major social political issue, the major social political issue of the century. And what are we to make of that? And how are we to evaluate it? They actually had Leon Trotsky staying at her house. And it's one of the other things that her, her parents had to put up with. Uh, though admittedly, she, I think, had an argument with him on, on uh, matters of politics. Um, yeah, so we had talked about before the ways in which Rand is an outlier in various ways from these other figures. She's the only one who, uh, for, for much of her life, is living in America, for instance, and thinks of herself as, a, as an American. Well, Rent spends a lot of time in America. Uh, well, at least for the period of time that we're talking yeah. about. But for the period of time we're talking about, Rent is... Because in... It's important because uh, why is she in America? She's in America because she's the, also the only one who has lived under communism and fled from it and took refuge in America. And the, I, I want to emphasize this because there are places in the book where when you're going back and forth between the different stories of the different figures, you see the Europeans living in pretty grim conditions because the Nazis are about to take over. And then you flip back to America and Ayn Rand's working on her novel in relative comfort. And to me, the implication the author's trying to make is she's not having to deal with so much. And that's part of what makes her humorous in his view. Okay, but it didn't get the picture of her life 
under communism in the Soviet Union that she fled from and that she knows a little something about what its implications were. And that's why when she writes We the Living, uh, it's, it's, it's not just a, uh, a fantasy novel on her part. She knows how socialism and communism destroy individuals and destroy the kinds of individuals that, that all three of these other women would have been and why they would have been destroyed under this system. I mean, so I, it is a pretty important topic. He's, he doesn't make enough, perhaps, about the fact that she did live under this totalitarian system. Um, and, but Arendt um, was a Jew in France a after the Vichy takeover. De Beauvoir lived through the whole period of Vichy France. Um, also, uh, Vey's family, right, they flee to America and she chooses to go back, but she goes back to England. So it, it, it's a little more complicated because they did live under kind of military sure. occupation. It's not the same thing. But I don't I don't think he's he's kind of making I think he thinks both historically it's the same dark times. And I, I, his perspective is Rand sees the whole world going to um, going to hell and is rightly, you know, we're wrong, but, but, but is concerned that America will, too. Um, so I think from that perspective, he's not taking her lightly. I think he's taking that seriously as, as a position. But. Um, um, I, 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 um, well, part yeah. of what I'm into is doesn't it matter that we have two wretched, monstrous evils spreading politically at this time? Um, and belatedly, uh, all of these people come to see some, at least something a little bit wrong with both of them. But for a large part of this, three of these four women are advocates of one of these two evils. I think it, if you're to giving the biography of intellectuals and uh, intellectuals in a historical period, uh, when uh, there's kind of monstrous evil and oppression going on, where they stand on it matters. And I think there's a kind of dancing around, there's thinking of it as sweet, that, oh, well, of course, they were idealistic because so they were socialists. And, oh, they eventually, you know, not, not even that long, came to think that communism was bad, too. Uh, but there's not, I mean, these people are cheering on pro de Beauvoir later than some of the others. The brutality of the USSR. At, like, Rand would not have wanted yes. to be in the same room with these people. And mm -hmm. because of this, and I think that issue made me, you know, that they're on the opposite sides of this kind of great, divide i think really matters and really matters to how you judge them like can you have been honestly a supporter of stalin uh a support you know uh, could you have honestly had trotsky at your house and what must you be thinking and what could individualism and life and all these things mean to you while you're you know yeah, so i mean this the the takeaway he makes about ve when she has trotsky in puts him up in her parents second apartment uh is Look at how brave she is to argue with this big man that everybody looks uh, uh, looks up to, and she's daring enough to like indict the Soviet Union uh, alongside the Nazis. Not, hey, she's putting up the commander of the Red Army so he can have a fourth international, and he's simultaneously defending the Soviet state while she does that. So you know, Trotsky looks kind of silly in light of it, but like, but not. Oh God! This is a horrible, horrible person. Yeah, and you can't um, imagine an episode like this th with Goebbels being passed over lightly, right? Yeah, no. yeah, that's right. No. Um, well, yeah, um, and I think that uh, you know, um, part of the, the da part of the problem here is in part like what work totalitarianism does, as if suddenly now socialism or suddenly now dictatorship becomes something totally different than what it was before. And that's sort of how Arendt sees it. It's like, oh, you can't confuse this dictatorship from totalitarianism. And she does point out, yes, there are some differences, but but they're they are alike in kind. And um and I mean in on to in Origins of Totalitarianism, which I read just for this the sake of this understanding better this book, um Arendt's uh, so it has three parts. The first part is on anti Semitism, the second on imperialism the third on totalitarianism. And my take is, you know, Arendt makes some good observations, some interesting and insightful observations, but gives very crappy 
I tend to think, explanations. And the entire section on imperialism is basically recycled Marxist views of of imperialism, like what causes it and what it's all about and surplus goods and surplus labor. And, and it's just, and, and she thinks that the choice of different economic systems is sort of irrelevant to political liberty, but then there's some other weird organizational feature about totalitarianism that suddenly makes it so much more monstrous. And it's just, it, it's, you know, I don't, it's not very impressive. Well, it's, it's inadequate. By the way, when I said he doesn't have time for this issue, I didn't mean that he gets, he gets a pass because he ran out of pages, but that he didn't make time for it and he should have. So I, I, I meant that to be critical. Um, it's interesting you just mentioned about anti-Semitism because that's, unless I missed it, he doesn't say anything about de Beauvoir's anti-Semitism. No. Yeah, and he's close to it because he's quoting some passages from her war diaries, her notebooks, where she makes some very unpleasant comments um, about the Jews and typical Jewish yeah. taking advantage and that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, of... Yeah, it's, it's, it's right in there and it's in her own words. So yeah. it's, it's there. I mean, in Arendt, um, in uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism, makes a claim, uh, she directly takes on the uh, conceptualization of the Jew that Sartre had offered and says, no, this is wrong, it, that it, it's the, it's, you know, you are as others sort of define you. And that's what, and, um, but what Arendt does, because this kind of got her in, in controversy in the Jewish community was she was willing to kind of name what scholars of Jewish history, serious academic ones had been identifying for the last generation or two, which is that the Jewish community had been self segregating in various ways. And that, you know, it's not just what they do to us. We wanted to be separate and so on. So um I don't know. That was another place where you could have brought any of these themes to light. Also, that was a view of Rand. It's not really said publicly, but in her, uh, it was definitely her view of, of Jews that she knew um, that they were racist because they were, and this was before World yeah. War II, uh, because they were cloistered and staying with one another and not, not socializing. Yeah. Um, that that was something really wrong and bad. One of the things that Hannah Arendt, one of the doctrines or ideas that Hannah Arendt is I think rightly famous for uh, is her idea of the banality of evil, which she uses to explain uh, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, how is it that this this low level bureaucrat could end up being responsible for mass murder? He's not the type you would imagine as as the mass murderer, the mustache twist, uh, mustache twi uh, twisting, scheming uh, uh, ne'er do well. He's He's a, a, a bureaucrat who's thoughtless, who takes the orders that he's given. And it's, it's, a, it's a, an insightful analysis of someone like Eichmann. But you'd have to think, what other, if, if, if it's so easy for uh, a low-level bureaucrat to become a, a killer because of his thoughtlessness, what other kinds of thoughtlessness uh, is there in the world that everybody takes as ordinary, everybody takes for granted? that could nonetheless be responsible for leading us to become killers. And one such, uh, one such example that I think escapes her notice and that escapes the notice of uh, several of these other thinkers other than Rand is uh, the kind of ordinary moral ideas that we all take for granted. The idea that Simone Weil takes super seriously when she says, let me be uh, a martyr, let me be a self-sacrificer. That's the idea that Rand thinks is ultimately responsible for the totalitarian regimes, both fascist and socialist, that they are simply putting into practice on a large scale the kind of insanity that uh, Vey puts into practice in her own life. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a banality that people take for granted that morality consists in this kind of sacrifice, but one that you shouldn't be thoughtless about. Uh, that you have to subject to scrutiny. And that was, I think, one of Rand's great insights. I agree with most of the criticisms made of uh, of the book. And yet I still 
see it as progress and as something that's worth reading um, for, for a couple of reasons. So it's, it's this category of popular scattershot um, impressionistic history. And there's, there are books like this. And, you know, one has to know when one's reading a book like that versus when one's reading a book of serious scholarship. That it's fuzzy, it's not too accurate, it's not well-sourced. Um, but, you know, that's a genre, whether it's a respectable genre or not, um, they usually don't quite come to that much, but they're sometimes interesting or thought-provoking. Uh, we can talk about whether there should be such books, but uh, there are. And if you just take it for granted that this is one of those, as opposed to, you know, high-level scholarship uh, or really careful, meticulous thinking. Um, I don't think it's bad for that kind of thing. I think it's pretty good for that kind of thing. Uh, it compares some thinkers who are interesting, who it's worth comparing. It doesn't go very deep into the comparison, but um, but it's thought-provoking by doing it. And the standard for people writing on Rand, outside of the people who do it really well, is really, really low. Um, if you look at philosophers who publish articles on her, even ones who don't think of themselves as taking pot shots, there's no thought, there's no appreciation, there's no delving into what might be of value here. There's no attempt to compare them thoughtfully to other people. So much of the biography of her is um, lame attempts at scandal mongering or being salacious rather than trying to think about how the ideas develop. And I think the project of putting her in parallel with other thinkers living at the same time, living through some of the same events, thinking about what she would have thought of their ideas and what they would have thought of her ideas, the attempts to, to give her take on individualism versus collectivism, I think are accurate and fair-minded to the extent that someone who has this kind of a worldview and is this kind of a writer can be accurate and fair-minded. It's not precise, it's vague, but it's not a caricature either. And she comes across, as do these other four, as interesting thinkers worth, com oh, sorry, other three, as interesting thinkers worth uh, worth comparing. And I think for good reason, because they are. And I think he did a good enough job to bring that out, despite um, being slipshod in his historiography, despite um, having some questionable moral views, despite not being terribly deep. And, uh, you know, not every author is going to be terribly deep. I think we're better off having this book in the world than not. It's interesting. It might lead people to uh, see some things of value in Rand who hadn't before. And it had led me to some interesting questions about uh, de Beauvoir and uh, Arendt in particular that I, I didn't have before. I knew a little bit about each of those things. Um, so I have a kind of very qualified, positive uh, view of the book. Uh, I think, Jason, you have a more negative view. But yet I think we agree on the facts of it. So that's. Yeah, I mean, I, I also I like I don't ask, would the world be better with or without this book in it? I'm, or, or let me put it this way. It speaks to some good facts that he did this book the way that he did about, you know, good about the reception of Rand. And uh, I don't think it, you know, it will hurt um, the efforts to understand her because so many people will get the wrong. Um, picture or something i just um i just and i'm not that worried about the person who this is their first entree to it and you know and then it spoils everything thereafter but i um, worry it's does it add value does it add value in some way and i think it does just in a modest way i mean i th i think there were some usually off base but occasion but often daring and interesting and once in a while ring of truth um kinds of comparisons or juxtapositions of her with something else. And I mean, if I discount the, the the value, the negative valence of all the things wrong or bad, and I just count those things and I go, yeah, okay, there are some things that I got out of it. Um, sure. I, I mean, yeah, but um, look, you know, it makes me all the more eager to to wish there was not just a, a really competent biography of Rand. <clears throat> Shush uh, no, I, 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 I've been working on the same book for 13 years, so I have no excuse. But, um, uh, no, but uh, an intellectual biography, right? The, a real biography of how her ideas change over this critical point. I think, you know, to really get straight 
when was she where with respect to Nietzsche and et cetera, is just, it's very much needed. And we've, in the companion, you know, Lester Hearns has, has written on that and it's better than the other stuff that people have said about that. But, you know, like we really need, and Daryl Wright has written about some of her early moral thought. We need more of this and we need, we need the big and it, picture. It also gives you, know? you a hint of what better work on that big picture of Rand can power. And what even the current work on that big picture of Rand could power if you had people taking it seriously, because there, there's a lot of interesting things to say about, well, how did she relate to other people writing at the time? What are the interesting parallels? If you think of particular current events or particular episodes or issues of moment in the period when she was writing, how did her position fit with the positions of other people who were thinking about that, say de Beauvoir or whoever it might be. And what can we learn about the, the issue, about each of these figures by doing these kinds of comparisons? And I think it's it's good to see that kind of work that we as Rand scholars maybe aren't in a position to do as well because we don't know all the other figures. But that work starting to get done, um, hopefully it'll get done better than this. And hopefully it'll get done in a way that makes better use of the really quality research there's, that's been done on Rand and hopefully even better research that'll be done on her in the future. But it's early days in uh, in that kind of intellectual work happening. And I think if we think about the level of that sort of intellectual work with any figure in the culture, how well Aristotle is treated, or Leonardo da Vinci, or you know whoever it might be, um, it's never done that well. I mean, so the, the standards, I mean, it is occasionally, but the standards by which we're judging this book, I don't think it's... Um, conspicuously bad by the standards of books that do this kind of thing. I think it's probably middling by the standards of books that try to do this kind of thing. I want to thank you both. I uh, thank you all uh, for having this conversation and uh, look forward to having more of them with you about other books that, uh, that, uh, that do or don't relate to Ayn Rand. We'll be, we'll be, I think talking about a variety of them on, multiple subjects in this series. So thanks for joining me and uh, good night to our audience.